fiber optic cable is today's topic. And so the type of structure we're talking about is a dielectric cylinder with a coaxial dielectric cylinder surrounding it. It looks something like this. This inner cylinder is going to have a radius A and a permittivity epsilon 1. And the outer cylinder, a radius B. And that region has a permittivity epsilon 2. We're going to assume epsilon 1 is greater than epsilon 2. And we're going to assume for our analysis that B goes to infinity. Now, this inner part is called the core. The outer part is called the cladding. In a real fiber, you'd have additional mechanical parts outside to give it structural integrity and isolate it and things. But for the electromagnetics, we just worry about these two pieces. And this, assuming that the outer uh, cladding goes to infinity, all we really need is that the fields are negligible when they get out to this radius B. But for mathematical convenience, we just assume that goes to infinity. So the basic idea why this works, we can understand if we this is now an end-on picture from along the z-axis. If we take now look, uh, look from the side, we'd see here would be the, the core with epsilon 1, and out here would be the cladding. And if we imagined, imagine now that this core is pretty big, uh, and so we can think about like little plane waves propagating along and reflecting off sides like this. And so this would, say, be an angle theta 1. Well, if it reflects off a planar surface, angle of reflection is equal to angle of incidence. If some of the field is transmitted into the second medium, that goes at some angle theta 2. And we define the index of refraction of the core. Uh, in all these cases, by the way, we're going to take mu is equal to mu 0, no magnetic effect. So... N1 would just be the square root of epsilon 1 over epsilon 0, square root of the dielectric constant. And in the cladding, N2 would be the square root of epsilon 2 over epsilon 0. And then at this uh, interface, we would have Snell's law that says N1 sine of theta 1 is equal to N2 sine of theta 2. We showed this in the lecture on oblique incidence. And now if we go to the extreme limit where theta 2 goes, um, and I'm sorry, that's the wrong, we're measuring those angles from the normal there. That was misleading why I drew that. That's theta 2. Um, if theta 2 goes to 90 degrees, then sine of theta 2 is 1. We'd have n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2. And if theta 1 gets even bigger, we'd have sine uh, N1 sine theta 1 is greater than N2, and there are no real solutions in this case, which means that no power actually propagates into the cladding. It all stays in the core. You get total internal reflection. And so this wave would just go bouncing off and bouncing off forever and ever in that inner core. So that kind of picture is reasonable for describing so called multi mode operation, multi-mode, because um, if this particular angle, theta 1, was bigger than the critical angle, which would be theta critical is the inverse sine of N2 over N1, then any angle bigger than that will also give you total internal reflection. You could have lots of different waves at different angles, and they would all have different uh, propagation times because they have different path lengths, and so those, you'd get multi-modes uh in the in the structure that's kind of a rough geometrical optic way to kind of understand that kind of a waveguide but we're interested in the real workhorse of the backbone of the internet and the telephone system single mode fibers and these regularly with current technology can get you say like 400 gigabits per second for a through a core that's only a few microns uh, in radius. So to understand these, we really got to drill down and do the electromagnetics. 
So what are the electromagnetics in this case? Well, we, we need to have solutions. And uh, because these are dielectrics, there's going to be field in both regions. So we'll have two solutions. We've got to make them match then at the boundaries. And the boundary conditions then will be that all of the tangential components of E and H are continuous at the boundary. So the boundary conditions are at rho is equal to A, the interface there. And the tangential components of E are E phi and E z. Right, this is E phi is tangential, and then E z would be coming out the page. And then the same for H, H phi and H z. So we will, as we've done with most of the waveguides, we've actually all the waveguides we've looked at so far, we try to break these up into TEZ and TMZ cases, because it makes our analysis simpler. But we'll see in this case, because we're going to have four equations here, the continuity of these four quantities, we don't actually get enough unknowns in just one or the other of these. So we have to actually to get the actual description of the single mode, th there'll be some TEZ and TMZ modes we'll be able to solve for. But to really get the kind of modes that form the, the single mode operation, we're going to have to get so-called hybrid modes. And these are modes that combine TEZ and TMZ components. And that gives us more degrees of freedom, more unknowns in our field that we can use to match all these boundary conditions. And okay, so that's true at rho is equal to A. And of course, for all values of phi from 0 to 2 pi, and all values of z. And because it's got to be true for all values of phi and all values of z, that means we must have the same functional dependence in the core and in the cladding for phi and for z. But we can have different dependence for rho. So let's take a look at this. Let's start off with trying to look at TEZ modes, right? In this case, right, we look at an electric vector potential that has only a Z component. And we're in cylindrical coordinates, so that depends on rho, phi, and Z. And we're going to have to have a form for the core and then another form for the cladding. And we need to think a little bit about the limit, physical limitations. In the core, rho is equal to zero is part of our solution domain. So the functions we use are going to have to be finite, not have a singularity at rho is equal to zero. That means, so in the core, we can only use the JM, beta rho rho type, the first type of Bessel function. The second type has a singularity there. Now in the cladding, we need fields that drop off uh, at least approximately exponentially with rho. And the JM and the YMs do not do that. But one of the types of Bessel functions that does is the modified Bessel function of the second type, KM. We'll have KM alpha rho rho, and this will have a factor, um, essentially e to the minus alpha rho rows plus some other as a square root of stuff in there and stuff but this this will get us our exponential decrease so that these fields drop off rapidly and they're effectively contained within a finite radius and remember that that uh, that function is itself formed as pi over two uh, minus j the m plus one times the second type of Hankel function, HM2, at minus j alpha rho rho. And this, the Hankel function, remember, is a first type of Bessel function plus or minus imaginary unit times the second type of Bessel function. And if you think of this argument as beta rho rho, this is a case where we put beta rho is minus j alpha rho. We use an imaginary beta rho, and that gives us this exponential decrease. All right, so based on that, we're going to take Fz to be in the core. We're going to have it be a constant A times Jm 
beta z rho, and we can use, all right, this has to be periodic in phi because right, there's uh, no boundary in phi. And so it, when we go around one time around the circle, we got to come back to the same physical fields as we started with. So we'll use cosine m phi and sine m phi or, or combinations. We'll, we'll just take cosine m phi. We could do cosine m phi minus phi zero like we did for cylindrical waveguides, but we're going to get into so much algebra here. We're going to try to keep things as simple as possible. We'll just take cosine m phi, e to the minus j, beta z z. And in the cladding, we'll take an amplitude c. We'll have this modified Bessel function of the second kind. And then we need to have the same phi and z dependence. Because again, these boundary conditions have to be true for all values of phi and all values of z, but only one value of rho. Now, under what conditions are these expressions, solutions of the Helmholtz equation in the corresponding dielectric, either the core or the cladding? Well, in the core there, we've got to have beta rho squared plus beta z squared is beta one squared. And that's omega squared mu zero epsilon one. In the cladding, we've got to have the same equation, but with a beta two and beta rho now really is minus j alpha rho. You square that, you get minus alpha rho squared. So you got to have minus alpha rho squared plus beta z squared is beta two squared, which is omega squared mu zero epsilon two. So those are the conditions uh, that make these solutions in the respective regions. And so notice from this, if you tell me beta z, I can solve for beta rho, and from here I can solve for alpha rho. Or if you tell me alpha rho, I can solve beta z, and then put beta z in there and solve for beta rho. So these three parameters, beta rho, alpha rho, and beta z are all tied together. If I know any one of them, I know the other two. So they really all together represent just one unknown. So I've got that one unknown, and then I've got these two coefficients. So that would be three unknowns. Although, if I had three unknowns and I had three equations, well, we know there's always the solution where A is equal to C is equal to zero, where you have just no fields, and that would be a solution. And so if you only had one solution, that would be the trivial solution. So we want non-trivial solutions. That means we want to be able to, for example, fix A is equal to one, and then solve for C and beta Z. So we really want to have a case where we have only two unknowns. Okay, so what are, will our unknowns look like? Well, what we gotta do now is take these and then go through and apply the various differential operators that give us the, these four components, E phi, E z, H phi, H z, and we gotta require that those be continuous at the boundary. So the three, Non-zero tangential components of the electric and magnetic field for a TEZ mode are, well, there's only one electric field component because a TEZ mode has EZ is equal to zero. And that is E phi is one over epsilon times the rho derivative of FZ. So we can look up our lecture on cylindrical coordinates where we derive these. And then for the H field, we've got H phi is one over j omega mu epsilon, one over rho, the second derivative with respect to phi and z of fz, and then hz, which is one over j omega mu epsilon, beta squared fz plus the second derivative with respect to z of f z. And so in the core, f z is a j m beta rho rho cosine m phi e to the minus j beta z z. So the z derivative is just going to bring down a factor from the chain rule of minus j beta z. And we're going to get two of those. So this will be minus j beta z squared is minus beta z squared. So this in fact becomes beta squared minus beta z squared 
times FC. All right, so what do we get in the core then, applying these operations to this function? We get E phi is A. Uh, we're gonna have a row derivative here that's gonna bring out from the chain rule a beta rho. And we've got one over epsilon and epsilon is equal to epsilon one in the core. And then we'll have from the derivative Jm prime, beta rho rho, cosine, m phi e to the minus j beta z z for h phi we're going to get a the amplitude um, we've got a derivative with respect to phi and z so the, the z derivative brings out a minus j beta z and that j cancels with this j here and then the derivative of the cosine is minus the sine, so that minus cancels the minus from the minus j, and then you get a factor of m from the chain rule, and then sine m phi, so this becomes a m beta z over omega mu zero epsilon one, one over rho, j m beta rho rho sine m phi, e to the minus j beta z, z. And then for h, z, well, beta squared minus beta z squared, from the conditions for this to be a solution of the Helmholtz equation, that's equal to beta rho squared. So h, z, then, just becomes, let's see, and the one over j, we'll move that up top and call it a minus j. We have minus j in the amplitude a, and then beta rho squared from here, and then this rest of this denominator, that's over omega mu zero epsilon one, and then jm beta rho rho cosine m phi e to the minus j beta z z. So that's in the core. So how about in the cladding? In the cladding, our FZ is C, KM, alpha rho rho, cosine M phi e to the minus J, beta ZZ. Z. Right? Now, we're going to go through the exact same steps just using those different functions. And then there's one subtlety here for uh, the cladding, beta squared minus beta z squared is still beta rho squared. But remember, beta rho squared is minus j alpha rho squared, uh, minus j alpha rho, and so that whole quantity squared would be minus alpha rho squared. And so we just gotta keep that in mind. So in the cladding, here's our functional form, and we find E phi is A, and um, we get uh, from the derivative with respect to rho, that brings out a factor of alpha rho, and the dielectric uh, permittivity is epsilon two, and then we've got a derivative Km. And the cosine. And that exponential term, h phi, that is one over j omega mu epsilon, one over rho, second derivative with respect to phi and z. So that'll be c, uh, we've got the derivative of phi that gives us an m, the z derivative gives us a beta z, and omega mu zero epsilon two, one over rho, am, alpha rho rho. The derivative of the cosine gives us the sine. And we've got this exponential. And finally, hz. So hz is going to look very much like we had up here, except now we're going to have a minus alpha rho squared instead of a plus beta rho squared. So we'll get rid of that minus sign. 
And so that'll give us JC alpha rho squared over omega mu zero epsilon two. Um, Km alpha rho rho and cosine m phi e to the minus j beta zz. All right, so those are the fields. Now what do we need to do? Well, we need to equate these. We need to set this equal to that and this guy equal to that. And then this, oops, I did that wrong. Let me do that again. The E phi equal to E phi, the H phi equal to H phi, and the H z equal to H z. Okay. Now, if we look here, the the phi and the z dependence is the same in all cases. So we can just get rid of all that because those are already equal. And therefore, that um, is going to leave. Just that you're going to have these different factors like uh, the Km prime is going to be equal to the Jm prime when rho is equal to A, and you take these other guys into, into account. But still, before we even start to work that out, one of the things we can see is we got three equations, right? This is three equations. In three... unknowns, right? Beta Z or alpha rho or beta rho and A and C, the amplitudes. And so three equations and three unknowns, if these are independent equations, has a unique solution. And we know what one of the solutions is. It's A is equal to C is equal to zero, no fields. So that's a trivial solution. But if you have three, three independent equations and three unknowns, that's the only solution we're going to get. So we don't want that solution. We want a non-trivial solution. So we actually need to have two equations in these and treat one of them as not an unknown. Say we set A is equal to one as a constant and then say beta Z and C are unknowns. We gotta get rid of one of the equations. Okay, how could we do that? Well, one of the things we can see is this H phi equation has a factor of M. So if m was equal to zero, those would go away. And moreover, you have, they have sine m behavior. And so, of course, sine of zero is zero. So we would get non-trivial solutions in this case. If m is equal to zero, we'll see that TMZ fields have the same limitation. So, what does that mean if we take m is equal to zero? We go back up here to our, you know, our, our functional form. It means cosine of zero is one. It means there's no phi dependence. The, the fields have to be uniform in phi. And this is the limitation of just looking at TEZ -E or TMZ modes. We don't have enough unknowns to satisfy all the equations, so we have to add this artificial constraint. Well, let's just go through that and look at it. So let's take m is equal to zero. So that gets rid of the h phi because those automatically become zero. And then what we're left with then, um, of course, the cosines also go away. And so what we end up with then is in the core, we've got e phi is a beta rho over epsilon j zero prime beta rho rho, e to the minus j, beta z z. And that's got to be equal to the e phi. Um, well, let's put it, let me put it here. Let me put the, actually the other uh, h z, because we, we said h phi is equal to zero. Let's, let's write it here. Minus j a, beta rho squared over mega mu zero epsilon one, j zero beta rho rho e to the minus j beta z z. 
And then in the cladding, got E, B is equal to C alpha rho over epsilon two, K zero prime, alpha rho rho, E to the minus J beta Z, Z and H, Z is equal to J C alpha rho squared over omega mu zero epsilon two, K zero alpha rho rho, E to the minus J beta Z, Z. So those are the non-zero tangential field components. So now we have two equations in our two unknowns. And so this, this will work out. And by the way, notice in this case, if we had um, taken, instead of the cosine behavior for the FZ, if we'd taken the sine, then those would, all the fields would have gone away in this case. And of course, that would just mean we needed to rotate things so that that would not be, uh, not be the case, rotate with respect to our linear combination of cosine and sine, the, the phi zero angle. Okay, so now these have to be equal. Now, of course, they have the same Z dependence, so that drops out. And so we end up with these equations. Setting these two equal, we have A, beta rho over epsilon one, J zero prime, and this is at rho is equal to A, so beta rho A. That's gonna be equal to C, alpha rho over epsilon two, K zero prime, of alpha rho A, and then for the HZ, canceling common terms like uh, minus, uh, like the J over omega uh, mu zero, we end up with minus A beta rho squared over epsilon one, J zero beta rho A is equal to C alpha, rho squared over epsilon two, K zero alpha rho A. So looking at that, that looks like two equations and two unknowns. They're linear equations in A and C, right? And so now we also can see now that those cannot be independent equations. Otherwise they would have the trivial solution. A is equal to C is equal to zero. So that means they must be linearly dependent. That means they must just be multiples of one another. In other words, the ratio of these sides will be the same when we're left and right. They're just, this is just a constant times that, and this is the same constant times that. Okay, so what we're gonna do then is just take the ratio of these two equations. And that'll give us a single equation that we hopefully can use to solve for either beta rho or alpha rho, and from that we can get the beta z. And then, knowing that, we can now take one of these equations, because they'll be essentially the same equation, just with a multiplicative constant, and use that. If we fix the value of A, then it'll determine the value of C, and then that's our solution. So we've got A beta rho over epsilon one, J zero prime beta rho A is equal to C, alpha rho over epsilon two, K zero prime alpha rho A. And we're gonna divide that by the left and right side of the second equation, minus A beta rho squared over epsilon one, J zero beta rho A is equal to C alpha rho squared over epsilon two, K zero alpha rho A. And it's convenient to define beta rho A as a dimensionless parameter U, beta rho A, and W will be alpha rho A. And then we take these ratios, the A's and the C's cancel, one of the alpha rows and one of the beta rows cancels, and the epsilons cancel. And what we end up with then is on the left, we will have J zero 
prime of u over, uh, here we'll have j0 u, and here we'll have a beta rho, one, because one of them cancels from this, and beta rho. So if we multiply this by one over a, so multiply both sides by one over a, then we can combine that a with a beta rho, and it'll get us a u j0 of u, and I'll move this minus sign over to the other side, minus, and over here, I'll have in the numerator, k0 prime of w, that's the alpha rho a, and in the denominator, I'll have one alpha rho left, with the a will give me a w, so we'll have w, k0, w. So that's the equation we have to solve. Say solve it for u, which means really solving for beta rho. Except now you've got a u and you've got a w. Ah, but they're related. They're not independent. Remember that beta z squared is beta 1 squared minus beta rho squared, and beta z squared is also beta 2 squared plus alpha rho squared. And so the equality of these two, we can write as beta rho squared plus alpha rho squared. So move this guy over to this side and then put that guy on the other side is equal to beta 1 squared minus beta 2 squared, which is what? Which is omega squared mu 0 epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. And because epsilon 1 is greater than epsilon 2, this is a positive quantity there. And so this leads us to define the normalized frequency, V, which is going to be equal to, well, and because I want this, this beta rho and alpha rho, I want to convert it to a u and w. Let's multiply this whole thing everywhere by a squared. So then you bring that in, then you get a squared, beta rho squared would be u squared, and then this guy would be w squared. And this guy would then have a factor of a. And we're going to take the square root of this and define that to be the normalized frequency. b is going to be a times the square root beta 1 squared minus beta 2 squared, which is going to be equal to omega times the square root, well, omega times a, times the square root of mu 0 epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. So it's proportional to the frequency, and it's a dimensionless quantity. We call it the normalized frequency. And so with that, this expression, or, or down here, likewise, uh, this right side is, is v squared. When you multiply a squared here, you're going to get u squared plus w squared. So you get u squared plus w squared is equal to v squared. And from that, you can solve for w is the square root of v squared minus u squared. So here's what we can do. We can take this, this is, this is w as a function of u, plug it in to this w here, and now we have a single equation in u, and we could solve that. Now we're not going to do that, because that's, this mode is not a ter terrible amount of interest to us, but let's just go through and see what the cutoff frequency will be. Um, if you look at j0 and j0 prime, j0 of x is greater than 0, or 0 less than or equal to x, less than its first 0, which is at uh, 2.4048. And in that same region, j0 prime is less than 0. But k0 of x is greater than 0 for all x. And k0 prime is less than 0 for all x. That means the right side, because w is positive, so this guy is 
negative, that's positive, and then so that whole thing is negative, but then there's another negative there. So this, this whole right side is always positive. But we can only have a solution if the left side is positive. But we just said here, for x between 0 and 2.4048, this denominator is positive, but the numerator is negative. So it's only when we go past the first 0 of j0, right? So we can only, only solve if u is greater than 2.4048. Um, but look here. u has got to be less than v because u squared plus w squared is equal to v squared. So u squared plus something else, positive, is equal to v squared. That means that v is greater than u. And u's got to be greater than 2.4048. So we conclude that you can only get solutions when the normalized frequency is greater than 2.4048. And so if there are any other modes that can propagate at lower frequencies, then we really wouldn't be very interested. If we're looking at the single mode propagation characteristics, we wouldn't be interested in this mode. And if we go through, and we do this in detail in the PDF notes, for the TMZ case, we get by very similar uh, calculations that we have to limit ourselves to m is equal to zero, and we get the same limit on the cutoff frequency. In fact, we get this exact same um, equation just with a ratio, a product of uh, epsilon two over epsilon one added in, and that's a positive factor. So it doesn't change this ar this whole argument about the science. So we also get the same limit. So the TE and TMZ modes have these cutoffs um, at 2.4048. Cannot have any of those modes propagating for a frequency that's less than that. So we're not really interested in that. We're going to try to look at so-called hybrid modes that combine TEZ and TMZ that can maybe take us down to lower frequencies. So, hybrid modes combine both TEZ and TMZ. That means we have both an electric vector potential, which has a Z component, and at the same time, we have a magnetic vector potential with a Z component. Now, this is going to give us more unknowns. That's going to give us more degrees of freedom to match the boundary conditions for the four tangential components, E, phi, E, Z, H, phi, and H, Z. Okay. So, using um, our uh, form for the T, E, Z, and then for the uh, A here, and we take the same kind of solution. Uh, we'll use B for the coefficient there, and it'll be JM, beta rho rho, uh, cosine, M phi e to the minus J, beta Z, Z, and D, KM. Alpha rho rho, cosine m phi e to the minus j beta z z, and we combine calculate what the fields would be for those that e phi e z h phi h z, and combine them with the t e z fields, and we have to do a, a rotation of the TEZ fields um, to swap the sines and the cosines so that they match up, have the same phi dependence with the uh, TMZ case here. Or we could alternately use the sine 
here in these or the signs over there in the vector potential. And this is what we get. So we're just, just without going through those steps that are detailed in the PDF notes, here's what we end up with. For E phi, we get total field, which has contributions from both of these parts. A, beta rho, or epsilon one, JM prime, beta rho rho, plus B, M beta Z over mega mu zero epsilon one, one over rho, J M beta rho rho, all times the sine of M phi e to the minus J beta Z Z. This now here is in the, uh, this is all in the core. Okay, so we're gonna have four field components in the core, and we've got EZ. And that is, well, there's only one contribution because the TEZ has no EZ, so we only get from the TMZ. So that's minus J, B, beta rho squared over omega mu zero epsilon one, JM, Beta rho rho, cosine m phi z dependence, and h phi, we get two contributions, minus a m beta z over omega mu zero epsilon one, one over rho, JM beta rho rho minus B, this is from the TMZ here now, beta rho over mu zero, JM prime beta rho rho, all times cosine M phi and our Z dependence. And then HZ is, and again, it only gets a contribution from the TEZ uh, component because uh, the TMZ has no HZ. So minus J beta rho squared over omega mu zero epsilon one, JM beta rho rho sine M phi e to the minus J beta z z. So because this is a combination of both TMZ, TEZ and TMZ, this is uh, the most general field that has sinusoidal dependence on phi uh, of the form cosine m phi and sine m phi. And if you combine these for all different values of m, you can make a general field in, that, uh, in the core. So in the cladding, we likewise have four expressions, but they uh, involve the, the KM functions. So let's write those down because this gives us our equations. So in the cladding, we've got E phi is equal to C alpha rho over epsilon two, KM prime alpha rho rho, plus D M beta Z over omega mu zero epsilon two, one over rho, KM alpha rho rho, and that's all times sine M phi and our Z dependence. And EZ, has only one contribution from the TMZ case, JD alpha rho squared over omega mu zero epsilon two, KM alpha rho rho, cosine M phi Z dependence, 
H V is minus C M beta Z over omega mu zero epsilon two one over rho AM alpha rho rho minus D alpha rho over mu zero KM prime beta rho rho times the cosine M phi e to the minus j beta z z and h z is j c alpha rho squared over mega mu zero epsilon two and only one contribution from the tez km alpha rho rho sine m phi and the z dependence okay lots and lots of algebra because we have so many unknowns and so many field components so now again we set each of these four expressions in the core equal to the corresponding expression in the cladding now uh right so the e phi is here e phi the phi and the z dependence will all cancel in all the cases and so we'll have just the stuff in the brackets here is equal to the stuff in the brackets there the easiest ones to look at then are the z components because they only have one coefficient because they only have a contribution from either the tez or the tmz cases so let's look uh, first at the hz's equating the hz's this is equal to that we get this minus a beta rho squared uh, over epsilon one we're going to cancel a common um, j over omega mu zero there oops that's times jm and this is at of course rho is equal to a so jm beta rho a and that's got to be equal down here uh we've got c alpha rho squared over epsilon two km alpha rho a So what we can do here, let's solve for C as a function of A. So, and let's do this just then divide by this over on the left. It's going to be C is equal to minus something times A. And that minus something is going to be, well, there'll be an epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. And we're going to have here, we'll, we'll multiply also both sides by a squared so that beta rho squared becomes u squared and alpha rho squared becomes w squared. Then this is u squared jm of u over w squared km of w, where w is alpha rho a. So there's, that's all times a. So that is one of our first equations. And if we also equate the EZ components, if you go through and do that, and we, we do this a little more carefully in the notes, but if you look, you actually have exactly the same types of terms. You end up, in fact, for the EZ, getting that D is equal to this exact same factor, which I'm just going to call R, I call this whole thing here, R, um, and instead of times A, it'd be times B. So we have C equals minus R A, and D equals minus R B from equating the Z components, where R is epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, u squared jm of u 
over W squared KM of W. And we're going to get so much algebra going on here that as much as we can just define things to be simple expressions, it'll make our life a lot better. All right, so now that's for the Z components. We get this relatively easy results there. Now we turn to the phi components. So if we look at the E phi components, um, for example, we're going to get, move that up a little more. This expression is equal to that expression. All right. Now we already figured out, though, how to write C in terms of A and D in terms of B. We can plug that also into that. So C and D we can write in terms of A and B. And now we just have an equation just with two unknowns. And here's what we end up with if we do that. We end up with A, beta rho over epsilon 1, J prime, and that's going to be a shorthand for J sub M prime of beta rho A. Okay, so just again to try to keep from having to write too much stuff here. Plus B, little b, which I'll define in a minute, over A, epsilon 1, J, and J is a shorthand for J M of beta rho A is equal to minus R A, that's, that's C here, minus R A, R is this expression, alpha rho over epsilon 2, K prime, where K prime is shorthand for K M prime of alpha rho A, and then minus R B, which is D, little b over A epsilon 2 K, K means K M, alpha rho um, A, where B is just a shorthand for M beta Z over omega mu zero. Because if you look back here in the, the E fees, you got this M beta Z over omega mu zero in both cases. So we're just trying to cut down on the amount of stuff we got to write. So we just make these definitions. All right, so that's going to be, that's an equation now just in two unknowns. Uh, well, really three unknowns, but two explicit unknowns, A and B. And then also it's implicitly the unknown, either U or W or beta Z. All right, so we're going to combine the A terms and the B terms. So what do we get in that case? So if we take that uh, previous equation, multiply through by a epsilon 2 and collect all the a terms, we get a times epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 u j prime plus r w k prime plus b, little b, we defined previously, epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, j plus r k is equal to 0. Now, if we go through and do those exact same steps by equating the h phi components, we get very similar expressions. Not, not exactly equal, but similar steps. We get this. a times something that looks like uh, this expression over here b epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 j plus rk plus b times something that looks kind of kind of like this but not exactly epsilon 2 over mu 0 times the quantity uj prime plus r w k and that's equal to zero. Now, uh, each of those expressions could be solved for B over A. And those expressions you get have to be equal because B over A is whatever it is. So let's see, from the first equation, uh, you move one, one guy to the other side, 
I'd move this to the other side, um, divide by a and then divide by this coefficient, you'd have a minus sign. So you get minus epsilon two over epsilon one. That's this, this, this term over, over here. Um, U j prime plus R w k over this term. And that would be little b epsilon two over epsilon one j plus r k would be equal to and now do it for this expression this equation that would be little b times epsilon two over epsilon one j plus r k over epsilon two mu zero u j prime plus r w k prime. So these two expressions obviously have to be equal to each other. So to get them into a little more usable form, I mean, we could try to just solve this uh, for say the u parameter, and that would give us the alpha rho, and from that we could get the beta rho and the beta z. But it's convenient to try to manipulate this some. We'll see, we'll get a more elegant expression in the end. It gives us a little more insight. So you can cancel the common minus signs and then cross multiply here. So this, this guy uh, and this one, I've, I left off my, uh, my prime over here, sorry. The primes go together, but I left off my prime there. So multiply this guy times, times that. Uh, and you're gonna get u j prime plus r w k prime, so that's that parentheses thing. We'll keep the epsilon two over mu zero on the right. And then times here, we've got epsilon two over epsilon one, u j prime plus r w k prime is equal, and then multiply this guy times that. Well, they're, they're identical, so you're gonna get a square when you do that. Um, and then this factor, one over epsilon two over mu zero becomes plus mu zero over epsilon two. And then we'll have this guy times that, which is just squared, b squared, epsilon two over epsilon one, j plus r k. And what I'm gonna do is move this over to the other side, just replace that by a minus sign. And then that's all equal to zero. So that's a, we've got less denominator stuff there. Uh, but there's a few other things we can we can do. And again, we're just trying to put it in a little more useful form for solution. We're going to um, multiply this whole thing through by 1 over the square of u squared j. So 1 over u squared j quantity squared throughout the whole equation. And what that's going to give us here, the first term, we'll put one of those factors with this and one with that. So we'll have uj prime over u squared j. The u over u squared is just u. So we get j prime over uj. And then here, we'll have r over the other term, r over u squared j, wk prime. And then one of the terms we'll put in with this guy, and that'll give you epsilon two over epsilon one, j prime over uj plus r, over u squared j w k prime minus mu zero over epsilon two b squared times, okay, let's see. So, right, and this guy was squared. Sorry about that. That times that was a square. So when we bring this inside the square, we get rid of that square, it's just u squared j in the denominator. So this will be j over j cancels and you just get one over u squared. So you get epsilon two over epsilon one, one over u squared plus r over u squared j times k all squared is equal to zero. Now, if you go back to our definition of what R was, 
R was equal to epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, u squared j over w squared k. This was the reason for multiplying by this 1 over u squared j term. So when you look at R over u squared j, R over u squared j is epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, 1 over w squared k. So let's see, what do we get here? Um, well, we get j prime over uj plus R over u squared uh, j is epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. 1 over w squared k, so one of those w's cancels, that leaves k prime over wk. And then here in this term, um, we're going to have, uh, here there's going to be a epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, and there's a common guy there, so we'll factor that out, epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, that'll just leave j prime over uj. Plus, again, we factor that guy out. So, wk prime over w squared k, which is k prime over wk, minus mu squared over epsilon 2, b squared. And here, let's see, we'll have an epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. And we'll, in the r over u j squared, we'll also have one of those. And that's inside a square. So when we bring it out, it's an epsilon 2 or epsilon 1 squared. But we had an epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 here. So let's just cancel that all out altogether, one of those factors. That leaves another epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 here. That epsilon 2 cancels this and then leaves an epsilon 1 in the denominator. So it'll look like this over epsilon 1. And then you have 1 over u squared. And let's see, this will be k um, over w squared k. Well, that's just 1 over w squared. OK, that's a simplification. We're getting the, the j's into this one type of factor and the k's into a, another type of factor. Now, we're going to have a further shorthand. We're going to call this guy, this factor we developed, we're going to call that F, and this guy we're going to call G. So now our equation looks like this. F plus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 times G. Again, a lot of defining things just to cut down our expressions to make them a little more manageable algebraically. And then this will just be F plus G. And if you remember these, this is when we looked at the TEZ modes, we, we got basically an expression that looked like this guy was equal to the minus, negative of that. So in other words, really this plus that was actually the solution of the TEZ mode. We'll, we'll see, come back to that in a minute. So then we got minus u squared over epsilon 1, b squared, 1 over u squared plus 1 over w squared squared is equal to zero. Now, b was the shorthand for m beta z over omega mu zero. And therefore, mu zero over epsilon one b squared, this factor right there, is mu zero over epsilon 1, m beta z squared over omega mu 0 squared. Factor out an m squared there. You'll have a beta z squared in the numerator. And what's left down here, one of these mu zeros gets canceled. You'll have omega squared mu 0 epsilon 1. But that's just beta 1 squared. So this is equal to m squared beta z squared over beta 1 squared. Now, moreover, 
because beta z squared is beta 1 squared minus beta rho squared, if we take this expression and we multiply by a squared over a squared, which of course is just 1, oops, then what we get is that mu squared over epsilon 1 b squared is, so multiply through by that over here, and we're going to get b1 squared a squared on the, the bottom. Up top, we're going to get beta z squared times a squared, but we're going to write that as beta 1 a squared minus beta rho a squared. So that's going to look like m squared beta 1 a squared minus beta rho a, but that's u, so u squared over beta 1 a squared. And now that can be written as right, this guy over, um, I'm sorry, this was squared. This guy over itself is just 1. It's 1 minus u squared over beta 1 a squared. Now, another step. Remember that v squared is a squared times beta 1 squared minus beta 2 squared. And so from that, we can write that beta 1 a squared is equal to v squared plus beta 2a quantity squared. Just turn that around there. But we could also write that as v squared plus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 beta 1a squared. Because beta 1 squared is omega squared mu 0 epsilon 1 and beta 2 squared is the same thing with epsilon 1 replaced by epsilon 2. So that's just a different way to write, write that. Okay, and then the point of that is now we have beta 1a squared here and a beta 1a squared, and we can solve for beta 1a squared. And this is what we get, because that's, that's the only, that's this guy hanging out here. So we can now get beta 1a squared in terms of v. And here's what we get. You solve that, you get beta 1a squared is equal to v squared times epsilon 1 over epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. Just move this guy over, divide by that coefficient, and this is what it looks like. Multiply through. <clears throat> yeah, so subtract this guy, uh, subtract this guy, and uh, so that would be 1 minus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1, which can be written as the inverse of that, and there's what you get. Okay, so finally, all of that's gonna allow us to express this guy in putting this guy in for the beta one a squared there. And this is what we're gonna end up with. We end up with u zero over epsilon one b e squared, 1 over u squared plus 1 over w squared can be written then as m squared 1 minus epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 u squared over v squared times 1 over u squared plus 1 over w squared quantity squared. Now we're going to define that to be m squared times h squared. Everything in brackets there, we're going to call it h squared. And with that, with that definition, our equation now looks like this. And we're just putting a lot of stuff into symbols to try to simplify the overall high-level expression. f plus epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 times g. Right, that's that j, over, j prime over uj, etc. 
times f plus g minus this thing, which is we're calling m squared h squared, is equal to zero. So m equals zero. In that case, this term goes away, and we have either f plus g is equal to zero, or f plus epsilon two over epsilon one g is equal to zero. And in fact, those turn out to be, go back and look at the equations that those represent. Those are just the TEZ and TMZ equations. So we're interested in M not as equal to zero, uh, not equal to zero. So let's do this. All right, this guy, if we multiply this out, this will be a quadratic in F or in G, but let's, let's make it a quadratic in F. Multiply out, here's an F squared. And then you're going to have f times g and f times epsilon 2 over epsilon 1 times g, which I'm going to write like this. 2 times epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 over 2 epsilon 1 times g all times f. Now you can verify the 2's cancel. Epsilon 1 over epsilon 1 is 1. That's this guy. And epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. Okay. That's a more convenient form. We'll see in a minute. Plus, and then everything else would be... What's left over uh, would be this g squared term times epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. And then minus m squared h squared. Okay, so that's a quadratic now in that function f. And it has two solutions. And those solutions are f is equal to minus this thing in parentheses, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 or 2 epsilon 1 times g plus or minus the square root of that thing squared, epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 epsilon 1 g quantity squared minus this expression. And that's the solution of the quadratic formula. And you can manipulate this guy in here. Uh, if you, this guy will have a epsilon two over epsilon one uh, uh, factor, and you can manipulate that a little bit just to get a slightly simpler expression. You've got a minus minus m squared h, and then this be, can be written as plus epsilon one minus epsilon two over two epsilon one squared times g squared. All right. So if you look at this, uh, in the case m is equal to zero, so this guy goes away. So notice this here um, will combine, and you can see that um, the plus, and this is m is equal to zero, the plus gives you the TMZ mode, which has an EZ, but no HZ. The minus sign gives you the TEZ mode, which has an HZ, but no EZ. So based on that, we in general, when you have M not equal to zero, plus sign, we denote um, as an E, H mode and the minus sign we denote as an H E mode that's just a common way to, to describe this and so what we, here's what we do uh, we go through and we can either just plug in uh, for a particular value of u right we know that uh, w is either the square root of v squared minus u squared so we can get the V's, and that allows us to calculate the F's and the G's, um, and then also the H. And we can just then go and see for that particular value of U, do we get one of these solutions? Uh, or another way to do it graphically is plot this guy versus U, and then plot th these two solutions versus U. So let's take a look at that. So here's an example uh, for M is equal to 1. We have these two solutions, and so what we can do is plot f of u, right, and that's uh, 
j of u over uh, j prime of u over u j of u. And so just plot that. That's the solid thick green curve. And then these two solutions, the plus and the minus ones, form the the you know the e h and the h e solution. So here's the e h solution and the h e solution. And if we get an intersection between f u and either of those, then that would be a solution of the entire set of equations. So we see that we do indeed, we don't get an EH solution, but we do get an HE solution. And because this is M is equal to one, and this is the first zero, right? We might have more zeros out here to the right. This would be called the HE11 mode. And this turns out to be the lowest frequency mode. This is below the 2.4, etc., cetera, uh, cutoff frequency of the TEZ and TMZ modes. And if you go through and do this for other values of M, you'll see that none of those have such low frequency. So this, this would be then the single mode that at this frequency here, this would be a case where V is equal to two. We go from U from zero to V. Uh, this would be then the solution. You can work it out, use about 1.53. So that fixes your beta rho. From that, you can get your beta Z and your alpha rho. And now you got everything you need to set up all your equations. You can fix one of the coefficients like A set equal to one say, and then those equations will tell you the, the B, C, and D values. And now you've got all your field components, all right? If you change the frequency, then you'd have to recalculate this solution. But that is the way you would determine, right? It goes with a lot of algebra, but once you've got it set up now, now you've got a thing you can easily program and find this solution for the single mode operation of the um, single mode fiber optic cable.